Have you ever been asked the question, <clears throat> what are Canadians like? That answer might depend on who you ask, but I'm sure, I don't know if everybody here is Canadian, but I'm guessing most people are Canadian. I'm guessing most of you have probably heard the stereotypes, right? Canadians are nice. <laughs> you ever? You ever bump into somebody in the grocery store, or so, have somebody bump into you and then apologize to them for having bumped into you? That's kind of a Canadian thing to do, right? Is to say that we're sorry all the time. Canadians are nice, one of the stereotypes. They like to watch and play hockey. I may have heard that one. All right, participation is minimal this morning, I get it. <laughs> they like maple syrup. Now, I like the fake stuff myself. I know. I know. I know, that's like heresy. But. Yeah. <laughs> How about this one? They say A a lot. That, that's a common stereotype, and I'm sure there's many others. Some stereotypes about what it's like to be Canadian are, are more true than others, but what I'm interested in this morning is asking the question, where do they come from? Where, the, where, where do those stereotypes come from? Where we say, oh, that's what, that's what Canadians are like. They come from culture. Now, culture, I looked this up in the dictionary. Culture is customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or social group. They are things that happen in a particular people group that causes that people group to take on certain character traits. That's what culture is. I don't think the stereotypes of Canadians are as true as perhaps they were years ago, and that's because our culture over the last several decades has been changing, and people have been changing along with it. I think it's probably safe to say that most Canadians don't really have a clear idea of what it means to be Canadian other than we're not American. That's probably the clearest thing uh, that most Canadians think about, right? But, but most people don't really have a clear sense of what that even means. Now where that will lead in terms of not having a clear sense of what our culture ought to shape us towards is going to lead to all kinds of places. I don't know where it will end. It's anyone's guess. But what is true is that culture shapes character traits. Now that's true in the church as it is anywhere else. The Bible tells us a great deal about the culture that is supposed to be present in the church. Now that does not mean that every church in every part of the world will look exactly the same. That's not what that means. When we're talking about church culture, we should not be thinking primarily in terms of language, or skin color, or fashion, or food. Those things can and they do vary from place to place. If you go to a church in Togo, West Africa, it's going to look very different from our worship, this, worship service this morning in terms of the people, the language, and the clothes. Right? That's going to vary from place to place. There are things, however, that should not vary from church to church. Sound doctrine, for example, should be the bedrock of the church across all time, across all culture, and across all geography. It is the sound foundation of good theology that enables a church to distinguish the things in particular cultures, in particular societies that are good and the things that are evil. The things that we can continue to enjoy and participate in and the things that we must avoid. Church culture has good doctrine. The Bible never, waves, never wavers on the importance of believing what is right and true. But it is equally clear, that is the Scriptures are equally clear, that knowing, believing, and enjoying what is true and right changes what we do. Church culture can never be less than what we believe. 
But it is always more than what we believe. We say we are Christians. I'm assuming many of you say that you're Christians. And the question I want to ask this morning is, what is that supposed to look like? What does being part of the family of God look like, practically speaking? In our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 6, turn there again in your Bibles. God speaks to us in these verses about what the church is supposed to look like. The Lord tells us here what his sons and daughters are supposed to be like. While these things need to be true of our lives as individuals, the emphasis here in this text is on the gathering of the local church. In other words, when people come into our community of faith here, when they get to know us, when they spend some time with us, they should see some stuff in this place. This text gives us three common traits that people belonging to the family of God should have. Now, of course, there's more to Christian culture than these three things. But these are the three things that this particular text focuses on. First, in the family of God, love must be tangible. In our day, it is absolutely critical that we have a right understanding of what love is. That's absolutely true. The world has gone bonkers in terms of what love means. We need to understand what love is. But we also, when we have proper affection for one another, we also need to understand that that leads to action. causes us to do stuff. In the family of God, love must be tangible. The very first word in the Greek sentence of Chapter 13, verse 1 here is the word Philadelphia. Does that sound familiar? It's the name of a city, right? In Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. Anybody know what that means? It's the city of brotherly love, right? That's what Philadelphia means. It's two Greek words put together. One is philos, meaning love, and the other is adelphia, meaning brothers. It's very important to ask the question, what is it that makes us brothers and sisters in the Lord. Why is that true? The New International Commentary points out on this verse that this is a very unusual way to talk in the ancient world. It was extremely rare in the ancient world for people to refer to one another as brother or sister if you were not literally brothers and sisters. That means you belong to the same family unit in terms of earthly thinking. But the Bible does that all the time in the New Testament. All the time it's calling us brothers and sisters. All the time. Right here in this verse, that's what it's calling us. Why? What makes us brothers and sisters? It's because according to faith in the death and resurrection of Christ, we have been made children of God. If you are a Christian, you rightly call God your Father. Therefore, you must call other Christians who rightly call God their Father. You must call them brother or sister. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters. And literally, the command here in verse 1, I'll just read, read verse 1. It says this, keep on loving each other as brothers. Literally, the command there reads, let brotherly love remain or abide or continue. In other words, it's something that needs to be actively kept up in our hearts. We have to fight brothers and sisters, against indifference. We have to fight against the coldness that our hearts are so prone to. We have to fight against things like anger. And we have to cultivate affection for one another. This is one of the most basic commands 
to believers in the New Testament. To love other believers. In fact, this is how Jesus said we would be known, right? He says, this is how all men will know that you are My disciples. That you do what? That you love one another. Now, in order to define the kind of love that's being talked about here, we have to go to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, if you go all the way back there, Jesus is called our brother. And so to know how to have brotherly love, we need to go to the example of Jesus. This is how we understand what love is. Now when we look to the example of Jesus, what we see is we see Christ having a tender-hearted affection for the highest good for those upon whom His affection is set. In other words, Jesus' love is expressed by desiring your highest good. That's how we need to understand love. When we see love in this way, it becomes quickly clear that this kind of love leads to tangible actions. And that's what we see in the first three verses. So, look there with me. First three verses of chapter 13. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Without a doubt, Christians are to be loving towards all people. That's true. The Bible says that multiple times. But having said that, it is particularly the affections that we have for other believers that are to pervade the culture of the church. That is what we are to be known for is love for one another. Certainly, brotherly love is shown to other believers we know. But... This verse in verse 2 is also commanding us to show affection towards those we don't. That's what it says here. It says, you've entertained, that is, you've shown hospitality to strangers. That is, believers from out of town. You've taken them into your house. You've cared for their needs. And it says here that, that people have done that. Some people have done that. And they've unknowingly entertained angels. Now that might be Angels from heaven. We see that in the Bible in several examples. Abraham gets a visit from angels. He entertains them. He provides food for them, right? We see that with Lot and with Jacob, a man named Manoah and several others. We see angels visiting people. The word angel, though, in the Greek simply means messenger. So this also might mean a traveling pastor. This might mean a missionary or an evangelist. It's somebody, regardless of whether it's an angel from heaven or just a regular pastor or missionary, it's somebody who's bearing the Word of God to people. What an awesome privilege that is to show hospitality to messengers of the Lord. It's amazing. He says, do that. Show that kind of love. Show that kind of hospitality to those who come in the name of the Lord. What is that? It's a tangible display of affection. Sit at my table. Eat my food. Sleep in my house. Next it says, remember those in prison. The word remember there likely means more than just bringing to mind something that you forgot. You see, in the ancient world, prison was nothing like it is today. I mean, if you go to prison today, it's actually a pretty cushy affair in comparison to the ancient world. All right? In the ancient world, you got locked up in basically a pit, of a, 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 a dungy, dark, ugly place to hang out, and they didn't feed you, they didn't bring you clothes. They didn't provide for any of your necessities. You know how you, you got by in prison? Your family and your friends would, would bring you stuff and to sustain you. So, so when he's saying remember those in prison as though you were their fe fellow prisoners, he's saying provide for their daily needs. Now that would take a lot of courage because 
If somebody was in jail for being a Christian and you brought them a meal, you brought them water, you brought them clothes, what are the jailers going to think about you? They're going to think you might be a Christian too. Where's that? Where could that land you? In jail right beside the one who's already there. Goes on to say, remember those who are mistreated. That is, those who are not in jail, but perhaps those who have lost property or employment or relationships on account of their faith. Remember those people like you are suffering alongside them. We already know from Hebrews chapter 10 that these people had suffered in, in, in ways like that. And he's saying, remember that. Remember people like that. Show affection for them, care for them. Why? What's the motivation behind all the risk and sacrifice that's to be on display between believers? What's motivating that? It's love. It's love. Most of us get that love is tangible, don't we? I mean, just think of somebody you really love for a moment, all right? Put them in your mind. Now imagine they call you on the phone and they say, My car is broken down. And I need you to come pick me up. And you say something to the effect of, yeah, so walk home. Uh, And then at the end of the conversation, you add, love you. (laughs) Do you? Of course not. Because we know that genuine love is tangible. It's the exact same in the church. Anyone who has sat through church on any kind of regular basis is going to have the knowledge in their head that Christians are supposed to love one another like brothers and sisters. But if we simply know it in our brains and it stops there, then we do not have the culture of the church that the Scriptures call us to. Love needs to be tangible. I have to confess that as I was preparing the sermon on these verses, they were a powerful confrontation to the coldness of my heart. My affection for you is far too small. And I desperately need the Lord to increase it. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you too. Your affection for fellow believers is very small. And we need the Lord to change that in us. Or maybe you're someone whose heart is full of love for your fellow believer. And for you, the exhortation of this text is keep it up. Keep it up. If love is not a significant factor in the culture of a church, then it is not a church. I'll say that again. Let that sink in. If love is not a significant factor in the culture of a local church, then it is not a church. This is the one of the things that we should be known for. Believers need to care about one another and you need to be able to see it. Here's another trait that's common amongst God's children. In the family of God, marriage must be deeply valued and protected. Every believer, whether married or single, must have an unwavering commitment to see husbands and wives live out, live out a picture of their covenant relationship to the glory of God. In the family of God, marriage must be deeply valued and honored and protected. This is plainly stated in the beginning of verse 4. Look there at the first few words of verse 4. It says, marriage should be honored by all. The word honored here is something that is considered very valuable. Something that is precious. Something that is of great worth. Something that is to be highly respected. It says marriage is to be honored by all. 
That is, every Christian, whether young or old, whether married or single, whether you're an elder or a deacon or a church member. The culture of the church is to be one where marriage is held in high regard. Now that begins with asking the question of, what is marriage? What is it? And the only way to answer that question is to know who defines it or where do we find the definition of marriage? Laws made by human beings are completely irrelevant on this issue. I don't care what the courts of Canada say. It doesn't matter what our politicians say. That's not where we find out what marriage is. God alone defines marriage. And did you know that He did that right at the very beginning? That was like one of the first things He did after He created people. Right? What did He do? He made Adam. He made Eve. And He brought them together in marriage. Right? And in doing so, He created this relationship to form a unity between two people that is unlike any other human relationship. Now that's important for two reasons according to the Scriptures. One, marriage allows for a magnified expression of bearing God's image. Now without a doubt, individuals, individual men and individual women, bear the image of God. But, Having said that, marriage adds another layer to that image bearing. You see, the Bible teaches us that God exists in three equal and distinct persons and yet is one being, right? We call that the Trinity. Now, nothing can adequately capture that incomprehensible reality of the nature of God, but marriage is supposed to point us towards that, right? You have a man and a woman who are distinct persons, that is, they're different. Right? There's distinction there, and yet they're equal, and God brings them together, the Bible says, and makes them one flesh. That's unity and distinction. Just like the Trinity is unity and distinction. Secondly, in addition to image bearing, secondly, the Bible uses marriage as a picture of Christ and the church. Ephesians 5 tells us that the husband is to be a picture of Christ to his wife. He is to love her at the cost... Husbands, listen to this carefully. He is to love her at the cost of his own life. He is to serve and protect her in complete humility just as Jesus was willing to wash His disciples' feet. That is, take the lowliest place of a servant to serve His disciples. Husbands, you're supposed to be that to your wife. The wife is to be a picture of the church to her husband. She is to honor and respect him. She is to follow his leading and submit to him as the church does with Christ. Now immediately, when I say that sentence, our culture is repulsed by that. People are offended by that. Why? Why are people offended by that? I would suggest to you that people are offended to that, by that because husbands fail to be like Jesus and wives fail to be like the church. The Bible is not calling men to be tyrants and women to be doormats. The Bible is calling husbands and wives to imitate a relationship of infinite, eternal, and perfect love. Now let the magnitude of that sink in for a moment. That's a high calling. That's a high calling to say the least. And it's one that must be honored by the church in the culture of the church. I think of it like a museum that wants to display something of great value, of great worth. And they put it in a glass case. Have you ever been to a museum? where they put something of great value, of great worth in a glass case. Why is it in the glass case? Why do they put it in the glass case? Because if it wasn't in the glass case and people mistreated it or mishandled it, the item would be ruined and it couldn't be replaced, right? That's why it's in the glass case. Now why is the case made of glass? So you can see it, right? That's why they put things in cases of glass. 
That's how the church should be with marriage. We need to honor it and protect it with passion and resolve so it might be on display for the world to see the glory of Christ in us. We're briefly told something of what that looks like in verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, it says, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. From what's already been said regarding marriage, it's safe to say that these commands represent a minimum standard for honoring marriage. This is like the bottom rung, brothers and sisters, for honoring marriage. A husband must cultivate his desires to be for his wife alone. A wife must cultivate her desires to be for her husband alone. And to do otherwise is a most severe offense against marriage and therefore an offense against God. To engage in immorality that is acts of intimacy intended for marriage outside God's design and therefore outside the covenant of marriage is also an offense against marriage and an offense against God. Now people today would have us believe that anything goes. And that you should just follow whatever desires you may have. Our government has even made it illegal to say otherwise. But no matter what happens, we must honor marriage. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to fight against sinful desires. Quite the contrary. I believe it's incredibly hard and costly to fight against sinful desires. What I'm saying is that knowing Jesus is worth giving up everything for. No matter what your desire is. In fact, I would say to you that your problem is not that your desires for evil are too strong, but your desire for God is too weak. It's not easy, but Jesus is worth it. Sadly, I think the church in North America has fallen disastrously short on being known for valuing marriage. I believe that's true in many ways. And it's something that we should lament over. It's something that we should repent from. It's possible to turn from evil and turn towards the living God, brothers and sisters. And I pray that would happen more and more in the years to come. And we would be known as Christians. When people think about Christians, they would say, those people have awesome marriages. That's what I want to know. That's what I want to see in the church in the future. I think that would be a tangible sign of revival in the church. If we just had good marriages, if we were known for that, that would be incredible. Because that's what the family of God is supposed to look like. Here's a third trait that's common or ought to be common amongst God's children. In the family of God, satisfaction must be found in God. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 6.6, that godliness with contentment is great gain. This is true not only for individual believers, but for the whole body of the church as well. In the family of God, satisfaction must be found in God. Verse 5 has two commands that are strongly related to one another. Look with me at the first command here in the first half of verse 5. It says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money. That's a hard command in the society we live in. It's a hard command because money is a necessary part of life, right? It's, it's through money that we purchase food. I like to eat on a daily basis. I'm going to need money for that. It's, it's through money that we purchase clothes. It's through money that we have transportation and shelter and education and recreation and the list goes on. Money buys stuff. 
Therefore, it is very easy to fall into the lie that money can provide security. People think, if I just have enough money in the bank, I won't have to worry. It's not true. It's not true. People who love money rarely, if ever, feel secure. They never have enough. Money lies in other ways as well. It promises happiness. But the kind of happiness that it provides is fleeting. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? He comes to his dad and he basically says, this is a paraphrase, this is not word for word. He basically says to his dad, I wish you were dead, give me my money. And his father gives him his inheritance and he goes off and he, for the first part, right, he lives it up. He has a great time. And then it runs out. And, it, and it's all fleeting. The same is true for everyone who loves money. True, they may never end up physically destitute like the prodigal son, but they will end up spiritually destitute. The love of money is a terrible trap and God wants us to avoid it. And the question is, how? How do we avoid it? That's what the second part of verse 5 tells us. Look there. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Another way of thinking about contentment is simply to be happy with what we have. Now I'm sure someone might be thinking, does this mean I should never buy anything new? To think of it in that terms, I think, is to miss the point. The point is less about stuff and it's more about depending on stuff to make you happy. Think of it like this. Imagine you're at work. You have a good job. You have a job that pays you enough money where you have more than enough to live on. You work hard at it. You're a diligent worker. And one day your boss comes to you and says, you know, uh, so-and-so, you're doing a wonderful job. I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. I'm going to give you a raise. Is that okay? Is that okay to get a raise from your boss for doing a good job? Of course it is. Does that mean because you got a job because you got a raise at your job for doing a good job, does that mean that you're not content? No, it has nothing to do with contentment. Totally fine. Now change the scenario a little bit. Same job, same work. In fact, imagine you're making even more money. You're making, you're making tons of money. You have all you could ever want, all you could ever need. You, you, your life is perfectly provided for. You're at work and your coworker comes to you and says, hey, you'll never guess what happened today. The boss gave me a raise to this dollar amount and it's higher than what you're making. And you're mad about it. You're upset about it. Is that a problem? Does that mean that you're not content? Absolutely it does. You see the difference? As the Apostle Paul says, it's possible to be content with very little. He says this in the book of Philippians. And it's possible to be content with great abundance because contentment has nothing to do with things and everything to do with your heart. That's what the rest of verse 5 and verse 6 are all about. Where is contentment? Where is satisfaction found? How can someone who has little in the things of this world be content? Well, they remember that the Lord is with them. They remember that the Lord is their helper in every circumstance in life. What's the worst that co could possibly happen if God is with you? Somebody takes all your property? What's the worst that could happen? Somebody takes your life? Well, if somebody takes your property, it's only a temporary setback. You're not going to live that long anyway. And in eternity, we inherit as God's children, we inherit the whole universe. <laughs> it's temporary. If somebody takes your life, again, a temporary setback. The moment you stop breathing. The moment your life ends, in the blink of an eye, you are with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is better by far. It is possible for the Christian to lose money, to lose possessions, to lose health, 
to lose prosperity and still be content. It is possible to end up dirt poor and barely making it from day to day and still be content. Those things are possible when we are satisfied most fully in God Himself. Is that what we're like as believers? Do we have that character trait of contentment? We're supposed to as God's children. We're not to be grumblers or complainers. We're not to be ungrateful or envious. We're not to be full of worry and frustration. We are to be satisfied in God. This is what it looks like to be a son or daughter of the Lord. This is what it looks like to be brothers and sisters in Christ. It looks like loving one another in tangible ways. It looks like holding marriage in the highest regard. It looks like being content in life because God is our greatest treasure. These are the things that we ought to be known for. These are the things that the culture of the church should cultivate. May God be merciful and grow these things in us individually. And even more so as a church so that all people could look at our lives and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. God, it is an absolute miracle. An absolute miracle if a group of people sinners who have lived in rebellion against You can come together to form a group of people for the purpose of worship. If we can come together and exhibit any of these things, let alone all of them, it's an absolute miracle. And so Lord, I pray for that miracle. Pray for that to happen in our church. That we would be known for these things. And that Jesus' glory would be magnified as a result. Oh God, be merciful to us. Please. And cause these things to be. In Jesus' name. Amen.
shall return.